Est-ce que la journée s'est bien passée Cool, c'était le but. Euh, on va terminer donc cette journée avec une conférence un peu spéciale. Euh, une personne donc, qui s'est déplacée depuis San Francisco, exprès pour nous aujourd'hui, et qui est le patron du Physical Web chez Google. Si vous ne savez pas ce que c'est, c'est l'occasion de, de découvrir. Sinon, euh, sinon je pense qu'il va vous impressionner avec les use cases qu'il va vous présenter. Donc, j'ai l'extrême honneur et je suis très fier de vous présenter Scott Jensen. Merci. Merci. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, I was told it was okay to speak to you in English. Um, thank you very much. Uh, ma français n'est pas très bien. No. Uh, J'ai passé une année scolaire en, à Normandie, à Caen, mais uh, je ne peux pas parler très, très bien le français. Donc, je préfère anglais, si vous voulez. Um, The reason that I'm here is that I have been on this mission for the last three or four years to talk about a new way of interacting with devices. And it's something that has been motivated by a UX concern, a user interface concern. And we wanted to understand the problem from the person's point of view and then develop the technology around it because we've been noticing over the last few years that there are more and more smart devices, whether it's a smart TV or a smart vending machine or a, even a smart bus stop. But all of these devices all have their own application, usually a native application, and that's, of course, understandable. It's the only way you can do it right now. But what's going to happen in, say, nine months or two years? I mean, are we really going to expect this trend to continue forever? It just doesn't make sense. It's going to have too many applications for us to work with. And because the web, the superpower of the web is that you can go to anywhere in the world instantly with just a tap. It's so easy to get there. It's often called interaction on demand. And you don't really need to install anything at all that seems kind of useful for this kind of smart device problem. So how could we you know, make this work? Because we've been so excited by the web. It's been around for over 25 years. But all we've really worked on for these past 25 years is this little white rectangle, the DOM, the document object model. And it can do some pretty cool things. But what about this place here on top, the URL bar? This place is really boring. I mean, the really big thing that we do is we just type in here. We have to go to, say, www.cnn. We've taken the most amazing rendering engine on the planet, and we've strapped a damn DOS prompt on top of it. <laughs> I mean, that makes no sense. This is something out of the 1980s, right? And it has not kept up with the technology. So how can we effectively get around this problem? And so the realization that I came to is that the web needs a discovery service. Why can't the web on my phone use the sensors like every other application is using its sensors? And so imagine if you were to walk into a space and there was a a bus stop, a parking meter, and a vending machine, and they're all wirelessly broadcasting their URL. What would that be like? How would that work? Well, if you walked into that space, you could, your phone could sense those, but to do the user interface, you don't just want to show the URL. What you'd probably like to do is find them and then display like the title and a little snippet and a little icon so the user could see what's around them. And then, if they tap, you just take them to the web page. The whole idea is to just get to, you walk up to the device, you see it, you tap, and you go. That's the overall user experience goal that we're trying to do. But how does this work? Well, right now, we're using Bluetooth low energy, and there were some talks today about Bluetooth. And it does a very simple thing. It just has an advertising packet, and every second it just goes, 
vending machine. Just, this is my URL. Just every second, just boom, over and over and over again. It's very low power. These beacons, I think I have one here. The beacon in this battery can last for three years broadcasting this URL. So it's not really that inefficient. And what, all that happens is that you need to have a scanner on the phone to be able to come by and see that URL and be able to then you know, display it to the user. So this is the physical web project. It's about having a bridge between the web and physical devices. So if you were to walk up to some device, it could broadcast a URL, the phone could see it, and then show it to you. That's all it's trying to do. It's just trying to make that connection. But when I explain it to people, there's a couple things they think about, because it's just a web page. But so often, they think of the web page for their company. They don't think of having a web page for every single device. It's a different way of flipping the problem a little bit. And again, the goal is to just simply walk up and use this device very quickly and very easily. But here's the big difference. Because there have been other beacon technologies that have been around, everyone assumes that when you walk up, you're going to get some vibration in your phone. And, and let's be clear, this is meant to be a universal system for any device. And so we cannot have it vibrate in the user's pocket. You could go to Les Halles, and your phone would just jump out of your pocket because there'd be so many things that would try to get your attention. So the way it works is that you have to actually get out your phone, pull down the notification manager, and look for things. The user must, we must respect the user's privacy, and they will only see these things if they ask. So the way this works is very simple. You have a device that broadcasts a URL, you find it, and you go to the cloud. But every time I make this presentation, I always get two questions. So I'll save you a little bit of time, and I'll answer them right now. The first question is like, but Scott, isn't this just like QR codes? Come on, you just have a URL and you get it. Yes, but QR codes suck. Right? <laughs> Nobody likes QR codes. Now, they are popular in a couple Asian countries, but they're limited in a very narrow market. They tend to be on receipts or on posters. So there is some use for them, but most of the time, they don't work all that well. Also, QR codes tend to be big, a little ugly, and you have to walk up to it and focus, and you have to get it. What happens if you have lots of QR codes in an area? What happens if there's a QR code in that projector? And I want to talk to it. I'm not, I'm not going to jump up there and get it. And also, just the, the distance, because you want to be able to work really far away. And so the intention is that, yes, technically, we're like a QR code, but we're an awesome QR code. And there's a big difference here. And it makes a big difference in the user experience as well. Um, the other thing is, aren't you going to get a lot of spam? And because this is built like the web, it's open source. And it's very, there's no centralized control. So yes, technically, things can sprout and appear anywhere. But we do a couple of things. One is that we use a proxy. And so when we see the URLs around, we gather them up, and we send them to a proxy service, which can then get rid of malicious, bad websites, filter a little bit. And it allows to kind of clean up the results a little bit. The other advantage to this is that it's much more efficient. The phone doesn't have to contact each website. And it also protects the user's privacy, because when you walk into a space and you're talking to these websites, the proxy talks to them, not the user's phone. So the user can't be fingerprinted. It protects the user that way, too. So this is based upon an open web spec, uh, open beacon standard called Eddystone. Eddystone right now has three different flavors, the UID, the telemetry packet, and the URL. And we just use the, the URL packet. That's all we need. You, just, you can just take this beacon, you can put the URL into it, and you're done. And it just broadcasts the URL over and over again. So our goal is to create, effectively, a whole range of devices that are broadcasting URLs in this very uniform, open source, standard way of doing it. And then have a bunch of possibly proprietary clients 
that are looking at it. So Google is building a client right now, and we're putting it into Chrome, but we want there to be other clients. We don't care if there's a, we think it's a good idea to have lots of different ones to do this. I was in uh, Germany two months ago, and they are very careful about their privacy, which is a very good thing, and they were like, yes, but uh, we don't want Google to be doing this because you have all this data. And I'm like, fine, then go use Opera. Opera has one too, because you don't need to use us. And they were like, Okay, no problem, because this will only work, only have trust if it's done in an open way that can do multiple different you know, companies involved. And so we don't want to be the bottleneck in this. So I've talked a lot. Let me just give you a few examples to kind of show how this works. This is probably our most interesting one from a technology point of view. We call this the Happy Meal toy. Um, we, uh, we built this using a little 3D printed plastic model and put a little Edi um, Edison board in there. So let me show you what happens here. You pull down the physical web, and you'll see that it shows up, and it goes, Tuga the turtle. So you click on that. And now the physical web is done, and now we are on a web page that's using the web Bluetooth JavaScript to talk to the turtle. And now you can say, make him happy, and make him silly, or make him grumpy. And then you can choose different colors. And as it picks them, you can see the colors are changing. And then once it's set, he has his personality. And then when you turn him upside down, his legs all vibrate, and he gets all excited. And we, we had so much fun making this that we actually had to stop, because we ended up all the time making a toy, and we were no longer working on the physical web anymore. Um, but the intention, of course, is that this requires a tiny microprocessor and a little Bluetooth and no internet, no nothing. Everything happens on the phone. So this thing, in theory, could be built for a year, two euros. And it shows you the power of being able to interact with something where all of the heavy lifting is being done on the phone. And the, this device just responds to a couple of commands. So the idea is that the turtle is broadcasting a URL to my phone. I go to the cloud, and I get the web page and the JavaScript. And then using the JavaScript, I can talk back to the turtle. Did any, if anybody saw the presentation today by Francois, he gave a talk about the, the candle. This is a very similar model, that the candle would broadcast the URL, and you would talk back to the candle. Um, but there's another way, a totally different way, a much more generic way of doing this. Imagine if you had a prescription bottle with a very small transmitter in it, and it would give you a URL, and you would just simply go to the web. Nothing fancy. This is not a smart bottle. It's just a dumb plastic bottle. But the idea is that then you could see in your language what the, what's inside, and it could be a video that tells you how to take it, and there could be all sorts of information as opposed to that giant piece of paper that you have to unfold and then you read in 17 different languages. It would just be this one little thing for you. Um, there are already beacon manufacturers that I've talked to that are making very tiny beacons with very little batteries that last for maybe two months. But they can make them for like 75 cents. And so they can actually put them in the bottle. So this is the kind of thing that we can expect, too, just very lightweight access to nothing but information, no interactivity, no smart anything, just information. The other thing we've discovered, though, is that as the web itself gets better, the physical web looks better. And we're just getting lucky because there's so many cool things happening with the web right now. Has anybody uh, heard about the push notification model for the uh, web? How you have a web page that sends you push notifications? So that's what we're doing here. This is a restaurant buzzer. So you're at a deli or a restaurant, and you see Bob's Deli, and you click on it. And then the physical web is done. And now you go to a web page that says there's eight people in line, and you push the button to say, get in line. And that registers for a push notification, and you put your phone in the pocket, and then 10 minutes later, when it's your turn, you do get a vibrating alert in your pocket. But the difference is that you asked for it. You've opted in to get that. And this is, I think, really interesting. 
In the United States, we have a couple of restaurants that like to give you these big plastic rectangles with LEDs, and then when you, it's your turn, they vibrate. I assume you, got, you have a similar thing here. Well, you could replace that whole system with a $5 beacon, and the whole thing would be replaced. So this is, and we didn't change. This is just the web being cool. Now, there's one more example, the third one, what we call cloud pass-through, where, in this case, the device sends you a URL, it goes to the cloud, and then in instead, the cloud talks to it directly because it has internet connectivity. Most vending machines or like soda dispensing, like a Coke or a Pepsi machine, they all have internet now. And so you don't need to talk directly to them. You can go through the cloud. So here's an example here we've made with a parking meter. So I pull it down again, and we can see the pay at parking. And I pick on that. Physical web is done. But now, when I click here, it's going to the cloud, and the cloud goes to this device. It goes up, up, and I hit pay. It does the payment in the cloud, and then it goes. Whenever I show this in San Francisco, people cry a little bit. <laughs> because we have a smart parking meter system, and nobody can figure out how to use it. Now, I will admit, I cheated a little bit. I assumed you did it once before, and you had signed up for the payment system. A couple times, people will say, yes, but do you use Android Pay? I'm like, I don't care. It's the web. Use you know, PayPal. That is above us. We just get you to the web page. Everything else is kind of manana. I don't care. So I want to stress this point a little bit. When you walk up to the device and you get the URL, and you discover it here on the phone, this is the physical web. But every time I give a demo, I end up giving a demo of something really cool about the web that's not about the physical web. We are just the discovery system, and everything else is just the web being awesome. Because what's going to happen, and this is where the Internet of Things comes in, more and more devices are going to be easily connectable to the Internet. There's a company called Particle in the United States that sells a small board for about 39 US dollars. That's a full Arduino board that lasts for months on batteries. It has a GSM modem in it and can receive about 5,000 messages per month. So anything now can be connected to the internet for just $39. It's getting, and that's in quantity one, right? So it's getting pretty easy. So what will happen is that we will be walking up to machines that have their connectivity, and my phone will have its connectivity. And the idea that we would be on the same subnet and talk over Wi-Fi is becoming a little old-fashioned. Because we, we each have our own connectivity. We just want to have a system that says, just, I'll meet you over there. And that's what the physical web is trying to do, is just say, I, we can rendezvous at that location on the web. But from a UX point of view, I've been doing two different things. I've been trying to show you the exact same user experience every time. You walk up, you pull down, and you click. But I've shown you three very different technologies, just kind of classic web with a, with a pill bottle, the more aggressive uh, JavaScript using with a turtle, and then the, going through the cloud with a parking meter. So these are three completely different types of technical plumbing that goes, but the user experience is exactly the same. So I just say this is probably one of the biggest learning I have had is the physical web gives you this user experience shell so that users don't care what happens under the, the hood. Um, but this is why it technical conferences like this, I like to go deep so you know that as a developer, you have lots of choices. The other thing that we learned is that when I first got excited about this and did it, I, I went on Craigslist. It's a, a for sale thing in, in the United States. And I bought an old 1970s vending machine. And I rented a truck, and I picked it up, and I almost took out my back. It was they're heavy. Vending machines are very heavy. And I took it apart, and I found out that the bill dispenser had $26 in it, so I made a lot of money. Um, but I, I ripped it all out, and I put in a Raspberry Pi, and 
And if you look on YouTube for physical web vending machine, and people will sometimes kind of go, eh, this is interesting. But when you walk up and you push a button and candy drops, they go, wow, that's like, they get really excited because they get candy somehow. <laughs> um, but it's a, it was a very good demo. But I, it's a very corporate idea about a vending machine. And then people talked about big city bus stops. And then people talked about movie posters. But all of these ideas are for business, for businesses to talk to consumers. And that's good. But as we started playing with this, we realized that there was actually a very personal side of things. So let's say that as I'm giving this presentation, I could have a URL, I could broadcast to everyone my slides. Or you could just put it on your dog or cat collar, and if the dog ever gets lost, anyone who finds it could then make, call a number and help get your, your pet back. Or even if you have a for sale sign in your car or on your house, in the United States, people put them in the back of their cars, but it has just a phone number. But now we could have pictures and service history and other things about it. So we think there's a very strong personal uh, consumer value, not just corporate value. So there's this famous phrase about the internet, the long tail of content, how if you take the bottom 95% of the web, it's much more active and busy than the, the top 5%. And uh, because there's so many really interesting small things on the web, and there's lots of them. And I've talked a little bit about vending machines and bus stops or luggage tags or even toasters. You could have all sorts of examples of how you could use the physical web. And each example is kind of, yeah, it's OK. But taken together, it tries to make this idea that there's this long tail of interaction, that if we have this universal system, Anything can talk to you. This room can have a session. This conference can have a sign-up sheet. There's all sorts of things that can talk to you that together we think will be a very long tail of useful things. The other thing is that so often people say that the physical web is the IoT. And I get really mad because I really hate the IoT. I think it's an overused word and it's very confusing. But imagine if we had a toaster that was just a dumb toaster, right? When you buy a toaster today, the box is covered with URLs and QR codes and, because they want you to go to their website. And what happens? You take the toaster out, you take the box, and you throw it away. And some poor marketer loses his wings, right? Uh, because you've just thrown away all of his work. Well, now you could actually have the URL be in the toaster, and it hopefully would say things like, a video on how to clean the tray or how to recycle it and so forth. And it's just a dumb toaster, but now you have the, the manual to do that. So we think there's actually a lot of very small, useful things that can be done that have nothing to do with the Internet of Things. So we, were on a, we have been open source since October 2014. We're one of Google's most popular GitHubs. Lots of people have signed up. We're very excited that companies like um, Opera and Mozilla are making their own physical web scanners. That is really good. The whole reason that we're, even though Google is pushing this and Google is trying to build it, like everything Chrome does, this only works if it's part of the open web. This will only succeed if we, as a community, want it to succeed. If this is a Google product, it's dead. Because nobody will, it's no one company, any company that tried this, it would, it would be dead. So it has to be kind of an open web standard. And we're very excited that this is all happening. So we have been putting the physical web scanner into Chrome. Um, how many people here have Chrome on an iPhone? Well, that, that makes me feel good. Thank you. Um, you all have the physical web right now because it's been there since last July, but most people don't know it because we, it's a little hidden. You have to go to the Today view and turn on the Chrome widget. And if you turn on the widget in the Today view, and you have Bluetooth turned on, then you will see that a couple of URLs that are out here right now. So um, that's been, and we have been in the dev release for Android, and we're going to be in the next release of Android. So next month, it'll be available to everybody publicly. Uh, the big difference that's taken so long for Android is that we made some changes to the operating system so that it'll be much easier to turn on. So what will happen with Android is you will walk into a room. If it has a beacon, 
and it's the first time, you will get one notification, just one, that says, oh, there's Chrome has found something nearby. Do you want to turn it on? And if you say no, we will never talk to you ever again. Okay, so we, 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 we want to respect these. But if you say yes, then, then you will start to get the, you know, the notifications. So it is the one time we will alert the user, but one time only. So this is what it looks like in iOS, and this is what it looks like in Android. And so we're hoping that by the time we release this uh, next month, we're going to start to get a lot more ex people excited about it, and people can start to count on it being around. Um, there's a lot of people that have Chrome on Android, and so we hope that will help get the ecosystem going. One thing I will say is that this beacon is um, a beacon that we use, which is meant for developers. And it, it's, what, what's really handy about it is that it has an on-off switch, which is really bad for public deployment, but it's really good for a developer if you have a bunch of these things. And if you want to program this beacon, all you have to do is just download the physical web prototype app that's both in the Play Store and in the iOS Store. We have one for both versions. Um, this is not the version that's in Chrome. This is the one that we used for months now to develop. If you have this app, you can program this beacon. And the way it works is simple. You just push the button, and it will glow blue. And when it glows blue, it means that you can change the URL. And if you press and hold, it will go red, which is off, which is really good. And then you, you can use this application to set it. So um, that's pretty much it. I try to keep this talk very short. Um, and I would very much like to know if there's any more questions, because there usually are. And please like to talk to you guys more. So thank you very much for coming. I have a question. It's very interesting, but in some of your examples, for example, the dog collar, mm -hmm. or for the medicine bottle, mm -hmm. or for the parking, you could use NFC, and NFC doesn't have a battery that will die. Mm -hmm. So if your dog is around for 10 years, maybe mm -hmm. the battery will die before. You have to change the battery. Okay. There's two, two issues here. One's battery, and one is NFC. Uh, NFC is a perfectly good sister technology, and we are not anti-NFC at all. The biggest problem we have with NFC is that very few phones have NFC in it, where almost every phone now has Bluetooth in it. So it's more of a coverage issue. Um, the other issue with NFC, of course, is that you have to know where to tap it. And, um, and so you have to, again, getting NFC to work on that. So we think the Bluetooth is a little more flexible. But to your battery issue, which I think is what motivates it, these things are changing so quickly that uh, right now, um, yes, this thing will last for three years, which is pretty long. But this is using last year's technology. The latest version will, will run even further, almost 50% longer. Uh, ARM, ARM Technologies, has now got a, three, a one volt version versus a three volt version, which will last like three times, well, twice as long. So it's almost coming to the point now where the, the battery drain is less than the, the natural decay of the battery. There's also a lot of, once you get to one volt, you can actually have a very small photovoltaic cell, cell so the thing will run nearly indefinitely as long as it has a little bit of light. So I will never say that the battery issue goes away, but it's asymptotically getting so small that for most cases it doesn't really matter as much. But I'm not anti-NFC. You're certainly welcome to use that. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I have a question on device authentication. Mm -hmm. So if I see a device in the list, how can I be sure that that item corresponds to some physical device and not some other device? Yeah, it's a, it's a basic trustworthiness issue. Um, when we start with basic information, um, it's less of a risk because you're going to the website and you're just getting data. When you do talk to a parking meter, we are uh, thinking we are going to discover new techniques. And so what we've discovered is what we're calling UX two-factor authentication. So if I go to the parking meter and when I connect to it, it kind of goes, hi, Scott, or it lights up. So when you saw my park, when I went up, up, it showed the numbers going up. That confirms with you that you are talking to the correct meter. And so especially when you're going to exchange money, 
we think it's very critical that you have that kind of UX interlock so that you get confirmation that you're talking to the right device. And by the way, we're only using HTTPS, so you can avoid mad in the middle attacks for just that reason. Hello there. Um, you only talked about mobile brothers, browsers. Sorry. Um, do you plan to release it on uh, desktop brothers? Um, eventually, yes. Uh, we have only so much energy, so we're working it on on phones first. Uh, that's where all the activity is. We will probably. It'll be very easy for us to move to Chrome OS which may not be what you need right now, but that'll be a very easy thing for us to extend to, and then we will go to the desktops. Um, so yes, the plan is to definitely go to broader ones, but people don't tend to use their desktops as much in a mobile environment as they do mobile, so that's why we do mobile first. So thank you very much, that was an awesome talk. Thank you. Um, so, this made me think about one thing. I don't know if you heard about the peng penguin barcodes. The penguin like, barcodes. Yeah, like QR codes that are cute, basically. And the, the biggest problem they have is that you don't know if they are there or not. Don't you have the same issue here? How oh. do I know that there's a beacon somewhere around me? Absolutely. I'm, yeah, that was a perfect setup question. Um, we think our situation is exactly the same as Wi-Fi in the 1990s because you had to have the Wi-Fi inside sign, and if you didn't, you had to learn what the Wi-Fi was, you had to learn what an SSID was, and so it took a while for people to understand what Wi-Fi was to set it up, and now everybody expects there to be Wi-Fi around. So what we're using is effectively our logo. We've open sourced everything, but we have trademarked the logo just so that we get people to use it correctly, and that's the only thing we do, and so we really want people that whenever they do start to use it, they use that logo so people can say, oh, I can get up my phone now. And so we'll probably use that as an indication. And then it will take, I think, a couple years to, of being prompted with the logo before people start to just expect that things will have it. And then that's more in the three to five year time frame where we'll say, what, my toaster doesn't have a URL? What's going on? But that's really far in the future, and we understand that. Hi. Um, how do you? How do you plan to manage information overload? Because uh, I can imagine that marketers will try to make beacons to beacon as fast as possible, like mm -hmm. tens of meters away. Mm -hmm. um, so I can imagine that if that technology is successful, uh, you're going to have a huge list uh, in your notification bar. Yeah. And how do you keep it uh, easier to find what you're looking at mm -hmm. than, than actually typing a short URL or scan yeah. a QR code? I get this question every time I talk. It's a very reasonable concern. It's a, good, it's a good question. First of all, I think as we build out this ecosystem, if there are dozens of URLs, that's an awesome problem to have because that means we have an ecosystem of people doing it. I think for the next nine months, I will be thrilled to see three, right? And so let's be really clear. It will take a long time before it gets to this point. But what we're hoping is going to happen, and one of the advantages of having multiple scanners being built is that people can experiment with, with different techniques. So on our part, we're going to start with a basic list. We will then sort the list based on signal strength, so the thing that you're in front of is, is really close. Then we can start doing anonymous data so that when you walk into like Les Isles and everybody picks on the map, even if the map is hard to, for you to, to hear, we'll put that one to the top of the list, like ranking, basic ranking. And then, if that still isn't enough, we could possibly do categories. So you do restaurants and stores and things. And finally, finally, if you have to, you can do you know, searching to be able to do that. So we think we have many levers that we can pull, but we also have, we think, two years before we'll really have to do it. Um, the one thing that I worry about is when you have something on a battery, you can't go too crazy with it. But if you take a toaster and you plug it into the wall, you can crank that power up there really high. I do not want to see my toaster in the bedroom. You know? And so I do think there's going to be some discussion about appropriate use of signal strength. Because in general, what you want these things to do is to have a very short radius. 
And if everything has a radius of, say, three to five meters, which is very easy with Bluetooth, then you can only see so much in five meters. And so we think that more modest use is going to be good. Um, obviously, though, if some marketer wants to crank the power in a store, then eventually we'll start to downrank those things because that will be silly. But that's the advantage of having a proxy. M by maybe the way. one, uh, one more last question? question. One more question. Makes sense. And I'm going to stick around afterwards, by the way. Hi. Um, I've, I've got a question about uh, authentication. As, uh, if I go by your house, will I be able to play with your turtle or know that you have this brand of toaster? <laughs> well, ag again, the, the distance of Bluetooth Low Energy can be quite small. So for the case of the turtle, it would have to be, I hope, it would only be three meters, which means that you would have to be really close to me to be able to play with my turtle. Um, and so I, I think that's... Uh, that sounds like an interesting metaphor of life, I think. Anyway, but anyway, um, but the, I, I think that um, that's a, a big advantage. And uh, in addition, remember, when people first thought about the web, they thought it would be insane that you would do banking on the web. But we do banking on the web. It is the web. You can put passwords on these things. So there's, there's multiple levels of authorization that you can do. I'm not saying that everything should be wide open. For example, maybe with a prescription pill bottle, you need to log in before anybody can see what you're taking. So we think that there's, and again, this is the advantage of being built on the web. There's lots of tools we can do to add more security on top if we want to. Okay? Okay. Thanks, Scott, uh, for this uh, great talk. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.